Hi everyone and welcome back to the Aaron Chronicle. My name is Aaron and today we are going to be talking about New York Fashion Week Day 1. So if that interests you, be sure to like and subscribe right down below and let's get right into it. So day one of New York Fashion Week looked a lot different than what we have New York Fashion Week in the past. Before it was a week long, it brought in $115 million in revenue for the city of New York City. So I guess you could say, I guess it was a good thing because there was a lot less traffic, a lot less hub hub around the city. But on the other hand, you know, that's the social part of it is part of New York Fashion Week. You can watch Sex in the City and hear them talking about how it was the highlight of their fashion calendar, of their social week. So I'm glad that they still did it because, you know, if we talked about it in the Dior Cruise Collection, you know, sometimes you need a little bit of pretty, a little bit of culture, a little bit of happiness during such a time of just... So it just seems like every day there's just something going on. So let's get into it. So they have a new setup. So this new setup has, uh, if you see me looking down, I got my notes going on here. But we had limited audiences. So some of the designers were able to, decided to show in person, but all the audiences were socially distanced. Um, in fact, the one that we're going to discuss today, who opened the week was Jason Wu, and he had a socially distanced audience. Some other designers decided to do a digital show, uh, so it was pre-recorded, so I get easier on the models, you know, having to run around and share models. So let's get into now that we've talked about their different setup and whatnot is who was missing? Who was missing from the week? There were a couple of really big names that I noticed that were missing, but it, you know, it opened up those time slots because this week was only for four days instead of seven days. Uh, it opened up for some of the smaller designers to come in and get a spot. So Mark Jacobs was missing, uh, The Row, uh, and Tori Birch are just some, a couple of the big names that you're going to notice that we're not going to talk about. Now, they chose not to show at all. Now, some have sh decided to show after New York Fashion Week. And so they are like Coach and Michael Kors. And we will talk about them at this point. Let's see, I have a list over here. Coach has already shown. They showed on the 22nd at the time of this filming, but Michael Kors has not. So their review will be post New York Fashion Week. So let's get into a little bit about this first particular show. Now we're going to do this setup a little bit differently uh, just to, because we have so much to cover. We won't be reviewing the fashion show kind of in time. We're just going to kind of talk about it and we'll put some highlights up here somewhere on the screen. So the first one is, or was, Jason Wu. And he showed it on a New York City rooftop. So he took us to Tulum, Mexico, and so it had this beautiful boardwalk with sand and palm trees and greenery, like who's ready to go to the beach? He definitely em embodied the whole idea of a mental vacation. Now, like I said, he decided to show it in person, so it was a limited audience, and you can see that all of his... Uh, the the audience was six feet apart and wearing masks. So good to see that they're being socially responsible. Now, if you would like to see where I get all of my sources, be sure to go and check out my website, which is called Erin Chronicle. And there I will have all of my sources listed. So be sure to check that out. So some of the details that we're going to see are a anglais uh, scallop base to the dresses. Then one of my personal favorite things that I would love to see more designers invested is vertical stripes. Vertical stripes, my people, like when I'm going out looking for prints, I want a vertical stripe because it's good on every body type. It's elongating, it's flattering, 
where vertical, uh, horizontal stripes on me just make me look wide, wide. And I, I want to look, you know, slimming up and down. So I was so happy to see that he's actually producing a contemporary collection that is wearable to, for the average person. Now, I don't know about you, but when you see these dresses, they're beautiful maxi dresses. And I, they look so comfortable. They look like I'm ready to go to the beach. Doesn't matter if I got a little sunburn that day. I'm just going to throw on this wonderful cotton sundress and maxi dress. And we're just going to go to dinner and it's going to be lovely. So uh, another thing that we saw besides the maxi dresses are the tailored Bermuda shorts which the last few seasons or collections that we've looked at, you will notice that Bermuda shorts are kind of a constant theme in these past few seasons. So they are going to continue to be around for next summer. Some of the colors that you're gonna see, that we see are navy or a dark blue, uh, a beautiful rust color, and then those vertical stripes that we were talking about. I love, this opening look worn by India Moore, who is a pose actress and an LGBTQ activist, plus activist. And I just, it's a great color on her. I think it would look good on several different skin colors. Uh, just a really great dress. So he also, at the very end, he uh, walked the red carpet, the runway, as most designers do. But if you see, he's wearing his mask, and it is for his give back that he's been doing called "Distance Yourself from the Hate." And he's also partnered up with Gay Men's Health Crisis Organization, that is providing food and PPE to communities that are underprivileged. Um. So if you would like to kind of uh, take a peek at that, I will link the original uh, show down in the description box below. And you can also compare it to the Dior uh, Cruise Collection that we also talked about how they chose to continue showing fashion because we need such beauty in such dark times. Okay, so Jason Wu showed his collection. And then we had the Harlem's Fashion Row Style Award ceremony. And they decided to do, the beginning part of it was a digital fashion show. And then they had their award ceremony. So the Harlem Fashion Row was founded in 2007 by a lady called, her name is Bandis Daniel. And we're going to go over the winners of their awards first. And then we're going to talk about some of the fashions that they had during the fashion show and some of the things that they brought and talked about this particular fashion week. Okay, so the first winner, this is give a little round of applause to the winners, because you know it's a big deal to win an award, would be the Maverick of the Year. His name is Edward Enifold, and he is the editor-in-chief of British Vogue. The editor of the year was Lindsay Peoples Wagner, and she's editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, and she's also the co-founder of Black and Fashion Council. The designer of the year was Kirby uh, Jean Raymond of Piers Moss. And the publicist of the year was Nate Hinton, and he's the CEO of the Hinton Group. So congratulations to the winners. You definitely deserve it. Um, okay, so now we're going to go into the three designers that they highlighted during their digital runway show. Now, these particular designers are going to get to have their collection shown on a bigger stage. And I cannot think of top of my head who is showing the collection, so I'll put it right here. Put it there. Okay, so what are the three designers were Patrick Henry of Rich Fresh. Uh, Fresh is uh, Patrick's nickname. Christian Laurent is our, the second one, and Kimberly Goldson. Um, I love uh, Chris, uh, Christian's uh, designs because it had a really nice 70s flair to it. And then uh, Kimberly, I loved the tights. I thought they were just the colors 
pigmentation, just those, I think that was my favorite. Uh, and then Patrick, this, this coat, man, this coat, I mean, I'm a sucker for anything that looks like it's from the 60s. But this coat, this coat, uh, mm, I would wear it. So what are some of their goals that Harlem Fashion Row kind of set forth this year? We've had a really great conversation in the world about making sure that people of color, uh, African American and Latino uh, people and uh, are welcome in every aspect and that's not just in, and we can also see that as designers as well. So they are seeking a 10 year commitment from the fashion industry, which is I think is great because in three to five years we might have this wave of activism over with and it might not be the end thing. So we need to have something that's continuing that conversation to build those designers up. I mean, it's already difficult to get into the fashion world, start your own business. It takes a lot of collateral, a lot of time, a lot of business knowledge, and it's just a super competitive environment. So I'm happy to see that they're trying to push these people up into the foreground. Now, we're all, they're also seeking to educate the public on systematic racism. You know, one of the things that they talked about that uh, Bandis, the, the president, our founder, discussed was that they've always been here. Uh, people of color in the fashion industry, it's not a new thing. We're just kind of bringing it to the forefront. So we need to educate the public on these wonderful designers, their point of view. And then they're also seeking to help these designers have resources to build their business and mentorship, which I think is great that they can really just help them get their foot in the door. They're also looking to provide retailers with independent and diverse designers through a program that they've established called Designer Entrepreneur Residence. So they bring these designers in and they help them grow and to uh, kind of uh, bring their ideas to these designers. Um, and it's important that the retailers who come in to buy the products are also having the opportunity to see them and that they're highlighted. I don't know if a lot of people understand that a lot of the designers, especially the luxury European designers, are all owned by one company. So they're going to have a lot of power, a lot of say. In fact, they were trying to buy Tiffany and company before the pandemic set in, which uh, there's been some back and forth of whether or not that's actually going to take place and transpire. So it's really important that these retailers see these when they go see these independent designers when they go in to make their purchases. And I uh, really want to end this kind of section off with a quote from Bandis that I thought was just, it, it really summarized what they're going for. And it says, seek wisdom. It will save you so much time. It may take persistence, but people are open to having the conversation and to helping people out. And that's a direct quote from her. So that's a little bit about what happened on day one. So be on the lookout because there's four days. So this is going to be a four-part series. And so this is part one. And so be on the lookout for the rest of the series to come your way. What was your favorite look from day one? And what do you think of this new setup? Would you like to see them continuing having the option to do these digital shows? Or do you prefer them having these in-person shows as well? So let me know it down in the comments below. And be sure to like and subscribe, you guys. I look forward to bringing the rest of New York Fashion Week to you. We have a lot more designers, a lot more pretty things to take a look at, and a lot more interesting things to talk about. So I hope you have a great rest of your, rest of your week and a great day. And I can't wait to see you guys back. Bye now.